Uh, my, I, I'll start by saying my mom, who's 84 uh, and fierce, um, tells me that my whole career is a scam. Uh, <laughs> don't, don't go to her for affirmation. Um, so, uh, and the, re the reason is because, you know, basically we're just telling people to do what we did when we were kids, and how can that be a job, is what she says, and I'm, but the answer is it's a pretty good job. Um, uh, so if you ever want, uh, I mean, I'll jump right in. Uh, it, what we're going to do, just so to give you an idea of the day, I saw, I, I actually read the thing that you put out that says what we're doing today about 10 minutes ago, so now I know. Um, <laughs> So we're going to do this talk, and then we're going to go downstairs. Uh, half of you are going to be, uh, you see, I guess you all saw the sand. Uh, so it turns out, I know this is bizarre to, to, to say out loud, that the way kids learn, the way we all know kids learn through sensory experience, turns out the grown-ups learn the same way. So we know if we spend a whole day here with me just blathering on and on, you'll be bored out of your minds and nothing will happen after this. So we're going to go downstairs and play. Uh, I get the unfortunate gig of being on the most beautiful day ever inside with you for my session. So uh, mine's going to suck relative to Jill's, I think. Um, but uh, so there's Jill. Um, yeah, formal introductions, yes. I'm Adam and that's Jill. This is not my sister, this is my wife. Um, uh, so uh, anyway, Jill has her, her degrees in early childhood education, so Jill has two degrees in that. I have none, so anything smart that I say with regards to your knowledge is just repeating what I heard her say. Um, so uh, anyway, so outside will be a whole bunch of activities that you can take home with you and do. The cool thing about this, uh, that I love about this workshop that we haven't done before, is that public health is supporting it. And they've also supported making sure that you have the same tools that we're going to play with here back in your facilities when we're done. So all of that's coming back to you as well. All the curriculum cabinets, all the stuff. Um, so we're going to split. So half of you go outside, half of you be inside, and then we're going to shift again so all of you will be able to play in the sand. Uh, okay, so into this. If you ever want a quote to justify anything that you're doing, just go to the EinsteinQuotes.com because they've got a quote for everything. Um, but I do like this. This is the work of children. Uh, play is their job. Uh, I, the, thing, the only frustrating thing for me is that that experiential, experiential education side of what we all know, you need sensory inputs in order to actually learn. It seems that as soon as kids know how to read and write, when we get into the next set of years, they forget it. And what I'm trying to do is not only talk, this is all preaching to the converted, most of you know everything we're about to do. But what we need is for you to now also go and tell primary schools and elementary schools and grade schools that they got to do this too. It's not just for little kids and it's not play, it's actually learning. Um, Little quick bit early on on the, on the talk, this is just to frame things. Um, how many of you, when you were a kid, uh, remember uh, being told, come back when the street lights turn on or dinner time? Yes. Show of hands. Okay, how many would tell an eight-year-old that today? Okay, we got one. That was bold. You put your hand up fast. You know what I liked about some of the, I, I liked some of the other hands sort of went like this. Like, just are, are they going to judge me? Um, so I'm not trying to judge anyone on that. It's just to illustrate that it's changed. So this is one family in Sheffield in England. The stats are the same here. And if you go back a few generations, it was as far as you could ride on your bike that day. That was the roam rate. And then, and for me, it was four kilometers. That was my roam rate. And I know because that's how loud my mom's dinner bell was. And so you had to be within earshot of the dinner bell because you caught heck if you didn't get back in time after the dinner bell went. So things have changed. Roam rates, average roam rates right now for kids who are eight years old in, uh, in North America are between 100 and 300 yards. So that's how far they get from their house. So even if they are going out to play, it's still within line of sight. So in terms of touching nature and in terms of having that experience with nature, I mean, it doesn't matter if the forest is a kilometer away. You're not going there anymore. We're seeing crazy stats. From our average age of visitors in Parks Canada right now is 53 years old, and it's going up. 
So that's, and that's because there's no one having that imprint early. You go to most, um, uh, most uh, uh, the average age, so what's the other one? Uh, Royal Botanic Gardens. They are putting in specific programs now to try and reduce the age, but their average age was 62. So, I mean, they're literally, their clientele is literally dying off. So if we don't start to do something that allows them to have that first experience in nature, they don't go out and seek it out anymore. So, uh, and, and frankly, you guys are it. You're that first experience with nature. You're that, that moment. So I'll, I'm not going to go through every one of these things. There's all kinds of stats, and there's more and more research coming out all the time. I'm a bit of a stat junkie, so I will quote stats throughout the day. Ones that are interesting to me, this one here, um, average screen time for an eight-year-old right now is over 50 hours a week. That's normal for them. That's a three-year-old stat. That's the Kaiser Family Foundation from three years ago. They didn't believe the stat when they actually went and did that study. And it came back with the first time they did it with a few hundred kids uh, around New York. It came back with a, uh, not that uh, huge a number, um, somewhere just under 50. So they went and studied more and they came back with a higher number. Um, the ones that I, I really get a kick out of uh, uh, that should be relevant to you, students are going to spend more time in your care than they will in university or college. And their brains are plastic when they're with you. You can, you can have really intense, serious effect on how they're going to grow and learn and what they're going to be and what is important to them. And you're going to have way less opportunity to do this as they get older. So in terms of investment, I think this is a, from a public health perspective, this is a smart thing to do. We got to get the youngest kids to have this imprint. A couple other ones. This is one that we get all the time. Um, you're going to have to, I think, if, you, if we all follow through on everything that we're talking about today, that note back to parents is going to have to go out. Maybe it's time to not wear the best clothes, uh, uh, right? Because the kids, guess what? The kids are going to learn, which means that they're going to be dirty, and that is a good thing. My dad is, um, has the Order of Canada uh, for his work in immunology. Um, so sorry, I'll just say it. Uh, it's easier. Uh, I always hated people who did slideshows where you, know, you had to read the slide. Yeah, I thought, well, if I didn't know how to read, I wouldn't be at this thing. Um, so, so yeah, so it, it, this basically just saying that dirt is good. Those micro and macro organisms that are in that dirt is important for our immune system. The work that my dad is doing right now is all around stress disorders and PTSD. And it turns out that post-traumatic stress disorder, you are the, a better treatment than any drugs they have out there is actually microbes found in poop and found in soil. Those microbes have a better effect on mood and PTSD than anything else. So we actually need them to get that, that bit of dirt. So what's happening from all of this stuff is that we're starting to see entire cities making a change, right? So Collingwood right now put out an urban design manual and they said you're no longer allowed to do plastic and steel. You have to do a nature-based play space. All of the play spaces in Collingwood by law now are supposed to, all the new ones are supposed to be nature-based. Uh, and yet we see this great stuff. Um, this is, uh, these, these are considered in their catalog, these are their forest trees, these things. So I guess that's, that's autumn here. I always, I always figure there's like a, lore, there should be a Lorax in this picture at the bottom corner going, you know. <laughs> yeah. So, so that's not a natural playground. Um, and, and we don't do things that represent nature. Uh, uh, that's, uh, <laughs> I was so happy when I got emailed this slide. This was awesome. Yeah. Don't, don't you kind of secretly want to go down that though? Yeah, I know, I know. So, but we're starting to see these things pop up. Not as gross as this, this is pretty gross. But you know the blue hippos and the uh, uh, orange caterpillars that you can buy, like the big plastic things? Like, <laughs> the problem with these things is you're not fooling anybody. You're not fooling the kids. I don't understand how a blue hippo has anything to do with what we are in Canada. So things that are designed by someone in California and then built offshore and sent to you in a crate or in a box is, has nothing to do with learning for kids at all. And it's only one thing. So if it's a car, it's only a car. And that's all it will ever be for them. So as opposed to things like this. So when you look at this, uh, just shout out anything that you see when you look at this picture. Like, 
Ah! <laughs> Look at that. Yeah, all of those things. I see a Yorkshire Terrier. I can't get my head. I, now I've ruined it for you too. Like, as soon as, now that I've seen a Yorkshire Terrier, I can't see anything else. Um, but, and if I talk to risk managers, you know what they say? Uh, uh, Parks Department risk managers, when they look at this, you know what they say? Splinters. And that's their first thing. All I see is splinters. And, and I'm like, okay, so you show me the lawsuit for splinters, <laughs> and I will stop doing this. But, but there, are, there is no such thing. There are no lawsuits for this stuff. And this, developmentally, and, and the other thing about this is this is just a place where bugs are living, and it's an entire ecosystem, and they will be picking away and investigating. I think there should be a big, fat, rotten log on every single playground everywhere. Everybody should have one of these things. Nothing more engaging. Uh, and yet we see this. This was a door prize uh, at, at a conference that I was in a year ago. And I changed my entire talk at that point. I just started to make fun of whoever bought this. Uh, so the, you know, the, the obvious question is, where do you get the radioactive worms from? Uh, right. So you know, big science without a big mess. And to be clear, that's just, there's no such thing. Big science for kids, this age, big science is big mess. That's what it is. You're making a mess and you're figuring that stuff out and you need to be allowed to do that. We need to give them permission, even prompts, to get, to, to get more messy. Uh, and, and yet, they're making money selling this, which is amazing uh, to me. Parents are buying it. Well, parents are buying, but I'm seeing it in, I'm seeing ECE, like I'm seeing this sold at every ECE conference I go to. There's like a booth with this stuff. Sorry, I should say Adults. Yeah, so we have a sign in our office. As you walk into our office, the main beam in our office like this just says, grown-ups suck uh, across <laughs> it. Yeah, because that's the truth. We're the problem, right? Uh, it's, it, and, and we get in our own way. Um, maybe we should just change that to the title of the talk. We'd do grown-ups suck as the title of the talk. No. Uh, this is how they're experiencing the trails in the woods right now. This, this is their normal. I don't remember these signs. When I was a kid, like, you went out, I mean, uh, these are real signs. I don't make this up. Um, I, I have, like, I do things, like, when I'm walking around and I see another dumb sign, I take the picture because I'm like, oh, my God, that's so great. It's so ridiculous. But we see this all the time. The do not climb trees, the do not toboggan. Uh, this is how they're experiencing the world. This is how, when, to talk about how grown-ups suck. This is how we suck. So one of the biggest problems that we're seeing is this conservation ethic that's been around for a long time where we're trying to protect the environment. We've been, for the past 40, 50, 60 years, 100 years, we've been making sure that we protect nature from, from people. That's sort of an effort that grown-ups have been making. And I, for me, that's about putting it away in the bank, right? We've been tucking it away so that for a rainy day, for later. Uh, well, it, it, the rainy day's now. Right? We have childhood obesity through the roof. We have kids who don't know any of their plants. We have uh, climate change that's you know, literally killing the planet. We have all of these issues. If it means that we have to take all those signs down so that the kids can destroy the first 10% on the edge of the trail, then awesome. They got in there, they got dirty, they learned, they got smarter in the process. So we should be willing to give up some of that. And, and guess what? It all grows back. Most of it grows back. And if we want them to care for it later, we need to have them experience it now. Um, so looking at a couple projects, here, this, this is the before picture uh, of a project that we did. And then three months later, that's the after picture of the same place. So you know that phrase, you know that phrase, less is more? That's a dumb phrase, right? Less is less, just less is less and more is more. And we are, the less, less thing does not work for kids. So this is less, right? So, and what happens here? So I'll tell you a quick story. So I got a, you know how you get a, a phone call and you, you look at your, or, or sorry, an email and you look at just the top line and you figure, you usually put your phone back in your pocket at that point, I'll deal with it later. Well, the title of the uh, email for this one was, um, we're having more accidents. That was the title. So I just phoned her right away, phoned the director and said, you know, this doesn't happen. We've been involved in more than 700 projects now and we have yet to get a phone call about the injuries. 
We, there just simply hasn't been happening. We're this weird playground anomaly where these injuries just aren't happening. They're small injuries. They're bumps, bruises, scrapes. They're what we call learning injuries, not catastrophic injuries. These are good things. Gold star, you got a bruise today, you're smarter, right? So we got to start, just as an aside, we got to start, you know, because you have to record every injury, right? Okay, we got to start recording learning injury when it's a learning injury and distinguishing between the two, right? So that we're teaching the parents when it goes back, hey, guess what? Bobby learned today. He has a big scrape on his arm and he's not going to bang that arm or be quite as brutal on himself next time, less likely to break his arm. So anyway, so we got that, that thing and I phoned her right away and I said, I, I, what happened? I can't believe something happened. Uh, uh, did, we, did something break? Did, what did we do wrong? And she starts laughing. And I said, what, what's so funny? Uh, anyway, she goes, you didn't read your email, did you? And, and <laughs> I, said, I said, no, I just, I just called you. And she said, no, the kids are peeing their pants more. <laughs> it's just like the best compliment ever, right? Yeah. yeah. So what was kind of cool about that is that we were doing some work with Western University and we started to look at where the kids were and what was happening before in this place is that the kids who were uh, uh, not, as, not the A-type kids. So these are kids with obesity or uh, cultural biases against it or language barriers or uh, disabilities. Guess where they were? They were hanging out at the toilets. They were inside staying away from this because this is like running the gauntlet for those kids. If you're an A-type kid, you can thrive here. So what happens when you make this change, when you stop thinking about just gross motor and flat plane, you, you add shade and topographic change and you have a place of mastery for every kind of kid, is that they all get to go out and play equally. And if you really think about it developmentally, okay, you guys right now, think of the kid I'm talking about. You'll all have a kid in, in, in there, the A-type kid who's your problem. All right, everyone's got a name in their head right now, right? All right. What do you want that kid to learn on the playground? What would you like for that kid to learn on the playground? Self-control, um, uh, self-esteem, self-esteem, that's cool. So that they're doing things right, so a place they can be successful, nurturing, uh, um, uh, being, uh, spontaneous social collaboration, which for us is a marker we track. I want to see how many times, without us intervening as grown-ups, they spontaneously interact with, with each other and start to work together. That's a big deal for me. So what happens on this place is you get very, very little of that. So we've actually created the wrong space for the kid that's thriving in this space. We're teaching exactly the stuff that we want to break those habits of. And for the other kids, we're failing them too. So we're failing on, on every end of the scale. So unless we start to have a more rich, nature-rich environment, a more sensory-rich environment, we fail both ends completely. So um, the way we look at it is if we've done a good job on building a playground, then this stuff should be easy. They should be able to find a bug. They should be able to come to you with a worm and say, what's this? These little moments are important. So uh, because I'm cheap and I don't like paying for photo credits, these are my kids. So there's Sam. <laughs> That's Leo. They, 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 they're, they're like this big now. So uh, I've, I've never done this talk in front of them. I'm sure they'd be horrified. But uh, what I loved about this moment for Leo was uh, you can't see him right now. He's invisible because he's mulch. That's what he told me. I'm mulch. So you can't, so you can't see him. You're not going to see the same kid say, I'm asphalt. You know. That just doesn't happen, right? So, so we got to have an environment where this is something that they want to do. And yet this is the repeatedly what we see out there and what we are constantly now being asked to remove. That's basically the bulk of our work. So here's a before picture. And if you keep your eye on that tree, there's the after picture and there's that tree. So the big mistake that we're making is if you have to have that standard piece of equipment, you've got to have it perfectly flat. And the, so this is fine. In where, when, when would this be the most use for kids? July, August, when they're not there, uh, when they're mostly away. So 
the, the hill is actually the best thing. If you're thinking about the winter, that topographic change is going to give you the biggest, uh, uh, the biggest change for their behaviors of any of it. So, and as many different surfaces as we can put in. I, I've heard the number three put out there. Usually we have five or six in the spaces that, that we create. And we want to create as many different pockets as we possibly can. Uh, sand, um, sand is, dry sand is okay if you're a cat. Um, not much use if you're a kid, right? So, so if you want to actually have sand, you've got to have water there. So uh, now, are, is this part of what we're doing? The, yeah. Okay. Okay. So some of you are actually getting this portable uh, pump as part of the, the for two year centers. Um, so if you think about this, though, we've got and another thing I'm going to say is that the transitions matter. The spaces in between where you transit from one space to the next space, those spaces matter. These transitions from one Thing to the next thing actually matter and the good thing about this just so from a CSA because we actually now sit on the CSA standard writing committee for playgrounds if you ever wanted like a tragic two hours of your life just go to that <laughs> but so it turns out that retaining walls uh, are not within the purview of CSA uh, so that is a retaining wall clearly right and uh, furniture is also not within the purview of CSA, so we do a lot of furniture. I haven't yet seen a kid who understands that that's a couch, mm -hmm. but, but we do this so that we can start to think about those transitions and have them find every bit of those spaces as a place to engage, right? Mm -hmm. So cool. when we did this, I remember the first time we did this, just in terms of CSA inspectors, because we all have inspectors and we all have uh, ministry guidelines and so on. And, and what's the, it's not Day Nurseries Act anymore. It is CYA, CCY, okay, I'm never going to get it. I'm never going to get it. There's too many letters in bumping around. So, um, so when we did this, uh, we were told the first time, well, you can't do that because you need impact rated surface down both sides of the slide. It's in the document. And, uh, and, and I said, well, we do. And at that point, we had rocks down the side. And, uh, <laughs> and, and they said, well, no, you don't. And I said, no, we do. It's impact rated for exactly the fall height, which is zero, right? And then there's this long silence like you just gave me. And they went, hmm, yeah, well, I guess that's right. And it is right. So you can, in fact, if you put it into a hill, do anything down the sides. The only thing you can't do is have something that you can swat your arms with on your way down so that you do one of those. You're not allowed to do that. The interesting thing for us, we've, we've also done these cool carved pieces. This is a 350-year-old tree. The reason I like showing this, aside from the fact that I just think it's cool, you see the daffodils growing around the edge. This was at a show that we do in the National Home Show. There's 100,000 people who come through in 10 days. And the first time we did it, we did this slide. And then the second time we did the show, we did that slide. And in the first hour and a half when we did the plastic one, those daffodils were toast in the first hour and a half. But when we did this wooden carved piece, exactly the same angle, exactly the same slope, all of those daffodils were alive on day eight. There was something fundamentally different about the respect with which they played and the way that they played when it was the natural thing versus the other thing. Um, oh, and, and, and quick footnote, if you ever do a wooden slide, do not try to buff it with ski wax. Um, <laughs> so it was slowing down over the course of this thing. So I, one, one evening I was out there with the car buffer and I buffed the whole thing up. And, and the next morning, the first kid to go down was like shooting out of a cannon. <laughs> they were, they were like, you know, it went like four feet off the end of this thing. And, and, and of course, now what do you think the kid did when he got to the end? Ah! Right? And everything was cool. And I like say, the next guy walking along is an 89 year old guy like this with his cane. And I'm like, no! So rubbing sand back into it to slow it down. So we did three things at another show. So we did, we did this and this and this at another show that we did. And it was cool because we got a really good sampling, 100,000 people through, you get to see what people like. So which one do you think engaged kids for the longest amount of time? 
It's a note for, for everyone here, you already know it's this one. This, if you wanted to find parents doing this, <laughs> for God's sake, just get my kid out of there. Uh, that was where all the parents were getting you know, bored out of their minds because their kids weren't going. Right. Yeah, so we're, you're getting these troughs. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's interesting. Uh, so what's interesting about this one? I got to I got to What's interesting about the way in kids in which kids play? We did this thing, which is a hundred thousand dollars, and stands up and in, in, in the middle of a, a place like this, and everyone's like, "Woo! Look at that! Isn't that amazing?" The third time a kid goes down that, they're like, all right, I'm done. Uh, next, you know. You can't win the adrenaline game. You, you can't. You will never get ahead of them. They, they will just, the more prescriptive it is, the less engaging it is, and for the smaller amount of time. So for years, we've been trying to think of how do we make things more jacked up, and this is a 10-ton tree that we flipped upside down, and honestly, that was so that the parents would show up and bring their kids, the kids would do this once or twice, and then the older kids would go to this thing. We've had one injury. In all of the shows that we've done, we had one injury um, in this, and this was, and it was a dad. Uh, <laughs> so what we watched on this thing was a dad, and he had a small kid, and the, his young kid was crawling up this thing, and, and, and the kid was r really unsure. And he was doing this with her, <laughs> like this far away from her. And we, I, we refer to that, because we have a lot of staff at these things, we refer to this as teaching them incompetence. So that kid was watching dad do this and saying, it must be impossible. I can't do this. There's no big deal if you fall. If you fall from over six feet, yes, okay, that's when we start to have problems. And I would say outright that we, are, we should be keeping everything under six feet. 82% of the injuries happen above six feet on a thing. The reason for those injuries above the six feet mark isn't because it's a bigger fall height. The reason is that the dynamics of falling means you land on your head. So you have these really awkward falls when you start to get too high. So we don't need to get them up that high. We just need to create great challenges for them lower. So what happened was the, the dad was there. He's following this kid. And in the background is mom, and she's sitting over there on the bench, and she's yelling at him, Simon, leave her alone, Simon, leave her alone. <laughs> and it's embarrassing for everybody, and this is going on. And he turns to yell at her uh, something, and then turns back, and his kid wobbles, and he dies for her, and he smashes his head on the side of this. And he turns to me, and he looks at me, and he goes, this thing's really dangerous. And there's blood <laughs> trickling down his face. Luckily, his wife was there, so she came over, and she goes, don't worry about it. I saw it all. He's an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> so no lawsuits, no nothing. But, but grown-ups get in the way of the good stuff, that's, that's for sure. There's cool things available in, the, in Europe that we don't get to do as much of, right? These create pinch points. People are freaked out about pinch points all over the place, so they, they get really worried about all the little nooks and crannies. And the reason is, oh, I'm going to use you as the example today. Look at that right there. You see this hoodie string? That's a strangulation hazard, right? According to the rules, if, if you look at who's actually died on playgrounds, and the numbers are tiny, like so tiny, it's crazy. More kids have died from falling on asphalt than falling in playgrounds. So, so they're, they're, what they've done uh, in, in the UK, rather than trying to get rid of every pinch point, if you show up at a playground in the UK, they snip off with, with the hoodie string, they just snip it off. Okay, we're good. Because that was actually the problem was the clothing not the thing itself. So we have to somehow start to get smarter here about the stuff. Couple of quick ones. So there's the, these are two bits of research. Um, the top one, I'm not sure if anyone's heard of this one. These are good ones to reference. This is up-to-date research. So of all of the research that's out there on outdoor risky play, taking risks outside in play. Um, uh, from it, when, when we were reviewing all of that, what they found out is if you actually take away all those risks, if you make it so that they don't climb and they don't have to assess those risks themselves, they end up injuring themselves more often and more severely. So we have to have them go out there and challenge themselves. We've got to create those opportunities to feel wobbly and unsure. They need that. That's part of their fundamental development, which is 
why we started, and it was during conversations around that with uh, Mariana, that we started talking about the, the distinct differences between learning injuries and catastrophic injuries. And that's part of the advice out of this, is what we were talking about earlier. The second one, remember when the climate change document came out? You know, the, 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 all the research people got together and said, if, you don't, if you're a doctor and you don't believe in climate change, then you're an idiot. Um, I, I know that's not what that thing actually said, but you know, you know, you know the document that I'm talking about. It's like a manifesto thing. This is like that for Nature Play, the Helsinki Alert last year. So that was the Nobel Prize winning uh, and Nobel Prize nominees that got together in Helsinki. They get together in Helsinki every year for immunology conference. And at this conference, they came out with a document, and the document said that the cause of these epidemic rises in type 2 diabetes, in stress disorders, in ADHD, in uh, obesity rates, in um, Crohn's disease, uh, is lack of contact with a biodiverse environment when they're younger. That if we don't get that when their immune system is developing, if they don't have those micro and macro organisms, they will get sicker, faster, more often later. So the bottom line is of the most up-to-date research from the best people out there, the reviews of all of the research that are out there, it's saying they got to take risks and they got to take risks in nature at, in your care. And if we don't do that, we are physically harming them. So a um, couple more shots. Traditionally, we think about playgrounds as a single thing for gross motor in a flat plane. And that's the thing that we got to get our heads around and get, get off our, out of our minds. So this is that as a before, and this is the after for the same space, right? So you want to deconstruct that. You want to spread your stuff throughout the whole space. You don't want to have just gross motor. You've got to have fine motor. You've got to have creative play sections. You've got to have places for dramatic play. You've got to find a way to have a place for the one kid to actually have a quiet, solitary moment. If you look out in your space and you don't have that, then that's going to be a problem. That's going to be a problem for the kids that need that. And what happens is, and if you look at the research out of Knoxville, Tennessee, from the university, um, there. The research there shows average times in the playgrounds are going up by 300 percent when you create that kind of environment. That's how long they want to stay there by themselves versus if you put in a plastic and steel thing and a rubber plane. So we want them to want to be there and what actually happens is you see them cycle. So each of the kids cycle through all of those activities. They all go to the thing that they're most interested in first but then they, then they start to funnel off to the next thing and the next thing, and they're cognitively engaged during play. Cognitive engagement during play is what we all want. We want their heads in the game. The injury rates go down, the learning goes up. So we have to think about it when we're designing these spaces for kids. We have to think about it in terms of their size and their age, not our size and our age and what interests us, but what actually interests them. So this is a low mirror because this is kids of a younger age that are smaller. We have to honor the fact that they're going to be just as interested in the border, in the edge of this thing, as they are in the actual stuff inside. So those borders are going to have to be thought through. And I'm going to show you my least favorite thing. So this is my least favorite thing that we've ever done. So if you look at this, this is at Bay of Fundy National Park. And we begged them to let us put this into the woods. Please let us just do, not this, but let us do all of the play in and amongst the woods because that's where, where we think it's going to be most successful. And they said, no, no, you got to put it out here in front of the woods. So where do you think on any given day the kids would be in this picture? In the woods. So every now and then a kid will come out of the woods, run up there to the top of this thing and go, well, that's weird, and then run back. There's almost no engagement, very little engagement. And then exactly the same design with lots of plant material and places to sit and all of the things we wanted to happen in and amongst the trees. The plant material matters. And I don't know if anyone has ever here tried to plant one or two little things, like our little row of shrubs. How long did that last? Uh, <laughs> so they've got to be big and they have to be more than you'd possibly normal, uh, normally imagine in order to work. And they have to be more and more varied, and you have to think, uh, think of places for them to sit and play. And this, by the way, is a spiral bench. It is not uh, a balance beam. 
we are going to uh, erase the word balance beam from our brains altogether. Because balance beam means I need to do 1.8 meters on all sides of impact rated surface and blah, 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 blah. But that's, about, that's not balance beam. This, this is just a spiral bench and it's furniture, so I don't have any of those rules. So it turns out there's shark infested waters around that <laughs> spiral bench at all times. But <laughs> So thinking about those rules and thinking about what's best for them. Um, so there's another piece of furniture. You can see here where I had Sam by his armpits and I'd shoved him into the chair. <laughs> you can actually see his armpits tucked under it. And that's the, that is that evil look, <laughs> right? Just before he's like, you got maybe half a second more and then I'm gone, man. I'm not sitting here. <laughs> so not interested. They, they want to maul this thing and climb all over it and count the rings and poke their fingers into the edges. And that is what is interesting to them in this. Uh, every now and then we see grown-ups sitting there, but you won't see that unless it's a posed picture. And yet this was my kid's playground. Um, so this is what we saw when we got there. And, uh, and I remember I met the, uh, the principal for the first time, and, and I, said, uh, I walked up to him and I said, okay, you, you, you see this? All of this is changing. Uh, we're changing everything here. And he looked at me, <laughs> he looked at me and he went, yeah, okay, whatever. And he <laughs> sort of walks away, and about 10 minutes later, he came back, and he said, oh, God, I just found out who you are. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and this is how intelligently they put the, uh, the fence in. Uh, that's, uh, that's Sam, who's responsible for one to three now. <laughs> His friend finishes the game. So... I mean, if we lose the lens, if we stop thinking about what's best for child development, if we stop thinking that way, then we make really dumb decisions. There should only be one reason for these play spaces for kids, and it's for optimal child development. And that's got to be the lens through which we make every decision. And if that's the lens, then we will do more nature, we will do more sensory, we will stop, like, that's just so, that's just so perfectly wrong. I was almost happy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I, I'm a little sad because it's because uh, it's so wrong too. So, this tree, this this happens to be the playground that I grew up playing on. So, when I was five and six and seven and eight, I was this uh, I was on this playground, and that tree was home base for me. And they put the fence on the wrong side of the tree, and I asked them why they put the fence in there at all, and they said, well, they put in that fence there to protect the tree from the kids. So my response to this, and I see this so often in playgrounds everywhere, all the best trees are just outside the fence. And it happens all the time. They should be inside the fence. And half the projects that we do, we just move the fence to the other side of the tree. And that's, that's like the first step. So in some of them, we're abandoning the playground altogether. Say, so you know what, this is so bad. Let's just fence the tree section over there and not even bother with this anymore and move off to that other side. So my, my response to them on this is, you know what, if that tree dies because kids are playing all over it, then that was a good death. That was what the tree was supposed to do. That was its job. So our job as grown-ups is to plant more trees and bigger trees so that there's a succession planting so that, so that they can actually have those there and available to them. So, and this is their playground afterwards. This is their main play feature. Is, uh, is this. This is a, where are they getting those trees? This is actually from the forestry department in Hamilton. So this one. It, the biggest trees anywhere are sitting in the middle of our cities because they're the ones that have been most cared for for the longest. And if you talk to your forestry departments, your local arborists, you should be able to find those trees. Yeah? Are you, what, you put something on it. It looks like there's a, something on We put nothing there. on no? this stuff, no. So we have preferred, um, we sand them down because I, I, mostly we sand them down because if you sand it down, you can see all of the rings. Uh, frankly, you're fine not to, because again, no lawsuits for splinters, so let's just move on. But, uh, but no, we don't finish these with anything. And what's been cool about this, this rot pocket is now actually a lot deeper. They've all picked it away, so you, they can actually get right in into this thing. How often have you seen on a plastic and steel thing, kids of three different ages, different genders, one reading a book, another one much younger crawling up to that person, another one getting ready to do the jump. You just don't see that sort of engagement on a, on a standard play structure. You just, it just doesn't happen. So, 
Last couple of, uh, uh, of pieces. This one's uh, Bishop Strawn School. I remember this one. So this is a Reggio uh, school. So they do a lot of journaling about the experiences of the kids in the space, um, which weren't happening pretty much at all on this space, because what are you journaling about, really? There's someone going down this. There's someone hiding underneath, trying to get shade. But that was kind of that was kind of it. So they also had a couple of broken arms, and they wanted to, to, to stop that. So this is the after of the same space. So what was cool about this, when we did, we did this, I still remember the lady who did the, uh, um, uh, she was, uh, she had fantastic fingernails. Um, uh, she had funded the project. Uh, and, and she said, she said, this is totally different from anything my kids really experienced before. How long do you think it's going to take for, for him to, uh, sorry, her, for, for her to, um, to get this and sort of know what to do? And I said, well, you know, I'm going to give her 30 seconds. Um, but I think you're going to need 30 days. Uh, so the other cool thing about this, we got a phone call on this one, maybe, oh, uh, I don't know, about a month and a half in, and they said, we got a real problem. And I said, okay, what, what, what's the matter? And she said, well, the bark's coming off. Uh, and, and I said, okay. Uh, and she said, well, what are we going to do about it? And I said, I, well, I'm not going to do anything about it. So what do you want to do about it? And she said, well, it's a hazard. And I said, oh, okay. Well, um, why don't we do this? Why don't you go and tell one kid somewhere that it's okay to peel the bark? And then call me back in a couple of days. She called me back in an hour and a half, and she said, okay, the bark's all off. <laughs> they were just like so couldn't wait to get their hands on it the coolest the coolest thing about that and the reason that we keep the bark on is because that all became loose parts for those kids so they actually developed we got a call six months later saying we need a pickup truck load of bark and i'm like well, hold on you're in the no bark people what's uh what happened and she said well what actually happened was that the kids have all created their own civilization and their own bartering system and it's all based, the monetary system is pieces of bark. <laughs> and what had happened was that they were all trading bark and, and one piece was worth one. So, so then what do you do, right? You snap it in half, I'm rich, right? <laughs> and they went on and on like this and everything was, was moving along and they were trading and bartering and they were using this and they had this whole system and they had storefronts and, and they were making things and, and selling them. And, and, and then it, one kid said, no, 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 the bigger ones are worth 10. And then the whole civilization just fell apart. That was it. <laughs> so they needed more, more cash quick. Uh, but that's pretty cool that a group of six-year-olds, five-year-olds could come up with their own civilization, their own monetary system based just on the loose parts. We clean our spaces to, to, to death. And, and all of that loose stuff is actually the good stuff. That's the stuff that they want to play with. The most terrible one that I ever saw was we were working on one where it was a YMCA space. We built that one out, and uh, only the YMCA kids were allowed in that one. And there was mulch up to the edge of the fence, and then it was asphalt for all of the school kids. And the kids were sticking their fingers between the chain link fence to grab little bits of bark mulch to go and play with on the asphalt. It was like... To agonizing to watch this, right? We're looking for anything. And, it, and even if you follow the rules, even if you follow all the rules, they're still going to break the rules. That's normal for them. They're going to find ways. Sam was to totally not interested in going down the slide. He was only interested in going up on the top because that was... So if they're going to break the rules anyway, then we, sh we should actually start to think about, rather than being so freaked out about that stuff, we should start to think about what's best for them, because the rules don't make that much sense anyway, um, that you should be proud to be Canadians. We mature six months faster than Americans. So, yeah, it depends apparently which side of the border on matters uh, as soon as you cross over. You go to Europe and they think we're crazy, right? They think that we're nuts because you, this, is, this is in Berlin, this is uh, trampolines and the impact rated surface is cobblestone. Um, and my favorite one is this one. This is what I, I call the child launcher. He jumps up and down and shoots kids in the air here. And, and that game goes on until someone cries, literally. Like, that's how it stops. They just keep going, and then someone cries, and then the dad gets off and goes, oh, well, I guess that's the end of the game. 
There are so many things that we can start to think of doing and we get so freaked out about one thing in particular. That is this moment, right? That's older brother making fun of younger brother because younger brother couldn't get to the top of that thing. We make it way too easy for our kids to get to the top of the thing. We have to stop that. We have to think about this in terms of graduated challenge. You want to reduce the number of injuries? Don't put any handholds on it. And the kid that can get to the top is the kid who can take the fall. And the other kids just can't get to the top. And that's good. That's actually what we want. We want them to figure this out as they go. The problem that we always have when we do stuff like this is watching the parent take their kid <laughs> and place the kid on the top yeah. when actually, and ruining it all. Because if you just let them alone, eventually this guy will get to the top. And that's actually going to be worth something now. We need to actually think about those challenges for our kids. And yet when we look at some places, this is how they think about boulders. Um, <laughs> This is the dangerous boulder. I love the fact that they use rebar at eye poke out height to hold up the safety fence. The solution is so much more dangerous than the problem. Thinking about when we're creating spaces, where can we put them so that they can feel like they're hiding? You think about kids, they have pretty much from the moment they wake up to the moment they go to sleep, they are being supervised and that is normal for them. So it is good if you can't see their eyes but you can still see some part of them. So a little cave that's a couple of feet deep where you still see an ankle out of there, that's awesome. Because they, they are actually fully out of your sight line. As far as they're concerned, you can't see them. But you can still see them. You still know they're there. You can still see their foot. You don't have to make them great big deep spaces. Sand, if you're going to do sand, you have to have a place to put stuff on the sand. And if you're going to do sand, make sure there's water. That's a stream with a pump that goes into it. And the key to these spaces and the way I want you to be thinking always when you're looking at your outdoor spaces is do you have something that covers all five senses? And if you do, then it is probably a good space. And if you don't, figure out what you're going to do for those other senses that are missing. And taste and smell are kind of tough ones, but it's all OK. In terms of toxic plants, there really aren't toxic plants that are killing people in Canada. It hasn't happened. It doesn't happen. Even the worst deadly nightshade, that's the one. You know how much of that you have to eat before you get, like, before you die or have to go to hospital? It's an insane number of these things. Tomato leaves are poisonous, right? But you need to eat, like, five full tomato plants worth of leaves to die. <laughs> so do the tomatoes. Don't, I think it's nonsense. And uh, uh, so you have my permission anyway. Um, <laughs> if you do those five things, you get the three big ones. And then, I, then we're going to go on to the next activity. The three big ones are kinesthetic sense. So that's Fjortoff's study that show us that balance and agility scores go up if we have uneven surfaces and we have all of our senses engaged. The next one is sense of place. If you do a piece of plastic from California, it's not going to teach them anything about where they live, who they are, what this country is, what their environment is, and that actually matters to them at five. They care at five about this. So we need to give them the opportunity to actually understand that, that sense of where they are and what their place is. And the last one is why we do crazy things like flipping a tree upside down. And this can happen with a butterfly and a caterpillar as well. Very hard to do inside this stuff. Much easier to do this outside. So I'll end with this slide, which is um, just to, to let you know, if anyone tells you not to do this stuff, um, then, then just push on through, because you're right. And all the best stuff's on the other side of that no anyway. Um, so uh, so that's, that's it for, for the talk part of this. Yeah. Uh, we have six activities. Um, the reason why you can deliver the curriculum is because it's all based upon loose parts. Um, and what you can gather from the neighborhood, the forest, wherever. Um, it's just using them creatively and I want to give you guys the tools to be able to do this. So providing different opportunities outside for the kids is really easy. Dirt is really good for kids' immune system. It also acts like um, the thing that makes people happy. They call it nature's Prozac. So you're going to be creative with the loose parts that you have. It's a sensory experience and it's free. The dirt is free. As a group, you're gonna be taking your favorite story and putting it onto little stones, flat round stones. Um, individually, you guys have your own little mat to do transient art with loose parts. 
and then you guys as a group get to make something as well. We're not going to disturb any big uh, logs on the ground because that's a habitat for insects and bugs. But we can take the thinner stuff and make some really creative forts out there. I've got some clothes pegs and some fabrics to make all that happen, which is a lot of fun out there. And these are our big drills. Now the kids aren't using these drills. It's us who will be using them to drill holes into the ground to plant willow rods. So you can make willow tunnels or willow forts. Um, willow is great because when it's planted, the first 12 to 18 inches are not bushy at all. It's just sort of, they're just sticks and then above the willow is where it all leaves out. It's nice to do it and say, that's great, but now how do I incorporate it inside or out at my center? Because some, like the transient art can be done inside or outside.